All right, guys. Well, it's been a while since we've done just a full all Peyton Boy pain points of wealth. Uh, we've had a lot of interviews the last couple of weeks. And so it's good to be back. Good to be back in full form. It's been a long time since I rock and rolled. You know, Bob's Led Zeppelin said. And man, oh man, guys, the uh, market has been extremely volatile uh, the last couple of weeks. So lots to talk about and catch up on. Yeah. Hey, Ryan, thanks a lot for uh, including us on this podcast. I uh, almost <laughs> forgot what you look like. Well, you know what? I thought, you know what, you guys, you guys deserve uh, to be in the spotlight once in a while too, but just once in a while, emphasis on that. Well, here's the fun part about investing, guys, right? You all know the expression, sell in May and go away. So I'm sure there are a couple of market geniuses that decided, well, let's sell in April, and this way we'll get ahead of the sell in May. Um, so they got out just in time, suffered a 4% loss, just in time for the market to rocket, you know, close to all-time record highs so far here in May. Yeah, within like two weeks' time. <laughs> yeah. got it all back, which is crazy. And it's funny too, Bobby, you know, I think you made this observation um, about a week ago, but two weeks ago, everyone was fretting about the fact that the Fed was going to keep interest rates higher because inflation has been stubborn. And then last week, inflation was still stubborn and the Fed still um, isn't going to raise interest rates anytime soon or lower interest rates anytime soon. And markets ramped on that news. <laughs> so same data, same response from the Fed, yet markets did something completely different, which just shows you, you never know how markets are going to react in the short term. And anyone tells you that they can, well, I got a bridge in Brooklyn I want to sell you. <laughs> hey, hey, Ryan, don't, don't bog down, down with the details. You know, he only trades on Reddit and meme stocks and <laughs> what, what he thinks Jay Powell's going to do. But, you know, it's funny. I met with a client yesterday and before my butt even hit the chair, they pulled out their April statement and they said, what are we going to do about this? I said, well, the good news is, is that April's in the past. Uh, you've already made back what you lost uh, over the past two weeks. And if you don't like the weather, just wait a few minutes. I thought you were going to say, Chris, the good news is I'll put this in my briefcase and I'll take it back to the office and I'll shred it for you. Always a better line, Dad. You always <laughs> have the better lines. <laughs> but it's like, uh, you know, I, I love it when you're, you know, you work on a long-term plan, you know, a plan for investing over 20, 30, 40 years, 50 years, multi-generational plan. Um and you say, well, what are we going to do about this three-week performance? <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. and again, it's, it's human nature, right? People have a, a greater affinity or a greater fear of loss than they do affinity for, for gain. Um, and it's just the way we're, people are wired. It's not, not a lot you can do about it. Controlling that emotion is the yeah. important thing. You also have to get what people's definition of long-term is. You know, Long-term for, for you might be uh, two weeks. You yeah. never know. Yeah, I'm always about my yield to lunch. So <laughs> by noon, my portfolio is not up. I'm, I'm not happy. But, you know, I think bottom line is a lot of the dynamics that we've talked about really just haven't changed that much. We just got through the first quarter earnings season. The numbers were phenomenal, right? We saw uh, you know, beats by something like 9% by most companies. And outlooks keep going up. So the Ford earnings picture just gets brighter and brighter. Uh, meanwhile, I mean, inflation has been stubborn, but it's come down a lot. And it'll probably continue to moderate. And we've seen the labor market has continued to stay strong. And I don't think people really feel it, though, which is interesting. I did a lot of meetings on the road the last couple of days, and everyone's talking about the same thing. It's like, man, oh, man, my wages aren't keeping up with inflation. So I think there is a real crunch people are feeling. But if you look out into the future or you skate to where the puck is going to be, as Wayne Gretzky once said, um, you know, wages continue to go up and inflation continue to moderate. So, you know, if that's the case... People are probably going to continue to spend money, even if they're still feeling the effects of that inflation. Well, I think the other issue is, and and look, I'm as guilty of this as you guys are. We always look for the data that supports our view, right? And you know, we tend to be optimistic, but uh, you know, we don't let that uh, elephant in the room get in the way of our optimistic viewpoint. But I find a lot of these commentators they they, they twist themselves into pretzels, you know, trying to explain away, <laughs> you know, why things are good, and you know, like the the consensus opinion is, you know, China's in a depression. It's never going to recover. Meanwhile, over the last three weeks, China has been the best performing market that I've been looking at, you know, followed closely by places like Germany and France and, and uh, Great Britain. Well, I was looking and the growth in Spain is actually higher this year than it is in the U.S. <laughs> you know, who would have, who would have guessed that? And, you know, and overall their economies are growing slower, but we always say slow growth is better than no growth. And they're probably going to cut interest rates a lot quicker than we are here in the U.S., right? We're hoping for a cut maybe in the fall. But by June, a lot of the major central banks in Europe are probably going to cut interest rates, which should be a boon for their markets. In fact, all their markets are at an all-time record high in their local currencies. 
So, you know, bottom line is there's a lot of places to invest money right now, and we've kind of been beating a dead horse. You want to move your money away from that magnificent seven, put your money elsewhere. You know, there's a lot of places to allocate capital right now that are probably going to be a better return over the next couple of years than just owning those mega cap names, and you're seeing it happen. It's already happening now. It really like, is. And it just like boggles the mind that uh, the money market portfolio value just grew or the, 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 the amount of money in money market funds is now exceeding six trillion dollars and you know psychologically it sounds really good i'm gonna get five percent guaranteed you know <laughs> no, no risk of going backwards but you know so year to date you're up two percent um where just about every other asset class is up anywhere from four to fifteen percent not including you know the dividends it's like okay we're just gonna throw the dividend in because we like you um and it's it's you know, again, it's, it's so so easy to to fall into simple terms like that. Oh, five percent's great. Well, it's not, yeah. you know, because you have inflation and you got to overcome taxation. And uh, as you've said many times, guys, you know, after you get out taxation and inflation, five percent you don't really make very much. Yeah, you're making like a quarter percent. Yeah, that, that's that, that's true. I actually uh, talked to a prospective client a couple weeks ago, and uh, one of the things they brought up is that they were complaining to their CPA that they actually went to a higher tax bracket this year. And they couldn't figure out why. And we did figure out it's because they had a million dollars in money markets and all that interest uh, put them up in another bracket. So they pay, ended up paying more taxes. Yeah, you forget you're paying ordinary income on that, right? If you're in a 25% bracket or a 30% bracket, you're already cutting your, down, your return down to closer to 3%. Then inflation is 3%. You just wiped out all your return. And again, that's a, that's a concept that's hard for people to grasp. But you know, we yeah. run wealth projections all the time. We, run, we have a great software program for that. And we can see just tweaking things. So making your income tax-free versus taxable. You know, Having a uh, tax-efficient portfolio where you're not paying capital gain, unnecessary capital gains tax on your mutual fund distributions. I mean, we've seen, it's almost miraculous, right? Like we have to rerun it a couple of times because we can't believe the impact of, you know, saving on taxes, being, you know, be more efficient in your portfolio, you know, retiring a year later, contributing a couple extra dollars to your retirement account. It really is incredible. But again, if you don't run the numbers, you don't know that. Yeah. And I think right now more than ever, right, we've got incomes on sale because if you have a diversified portfolio, most markets around the world pay a lot of dividends and trade a lot cheaper than just owning blindly the S&P 500, which we know is overweighted to five stocks, right? <laughs> So you have an opportunity to do that. You have an opportunity to lock into longer term bonds, ideally tax free if you're in a higher tax bracket right now, while rates are at a 15 year high. So, and also, I mean, it's like sitting and waiting is the worst thing you can do. You know, the Fed puts back. We know if uh, the economy does slow down, the Fed's going to cut interest rates. Jay Powell basically told us that a week ago. Uh, if the data staying is good, the market's going to do well. So it's kind of like heads you win, tails you win. And on top of that, you still have that $6 trillion in cash just sitting on the sidelines as like a powder keg. So if the news is good, you're going to have all this money rushing at the same time. You want to be ahead of that. You want to allocate your portfolio now. You don't want to wait. Hey, Chris, it's a good thing your brother doesn't run a casino. Heads you win, tails you win. Boy, he'd be broke in a hurry, wouldn't he? <laughs> well, you know, he wouldn't be very different than Donald Trump down in Atlantic City. All those casinos have been torn down at this point, I think. So. <laughs> Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 153, Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. But if you saved over a million dollars for your financial independence plan, and you want a more hands-on approach, Bob, Chris, and I now have a collective 75 years helping individuals just like you with your planning and investing. This is what we do every single day. We'll put together for you a total financial master plan. We'll do a bird's eye view of your entire financial life and hone in on every financial issue you need to address today. There's not a firm out there that will do this work up front. In fact, we'll build you your own personalized financial portal. We'll go through and look at everything you need from an income plan for retirement. How do you draw from your portfolio? How do you take social security? We'll do a full deep dive of your total portfolio. Look at your diversification. Have you had way too much money in the market? Have you seen your portfolio go up and down like a yo-yo or have you been sitting in cash, paralysis by analysis, can't figure out what to do? We'll put together a full investment game plan. We'll show you how to grow your wealth, tie it to your goals, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life. And we'll look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, tax inefficient products, whether it's an annuity, insurance product, structured product, brokerage product. We'll do a deep dive of all those investments, show you how to reduce the cost and optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's now what you make. 
It's what you take. You'll get a full tax playbook. If you saved over a million dollars for your financial independence plan, simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan or click on the link below to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point. Of course, that's P-A-Y-N-E. Having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And Bob and Chris, you know, obviously we look at a lot of portfolios every month. I think our firm looks at over 50 portfolios a month. So we know exactly what everybody's doing at every firm. We know all the mistakes that are happening right now with your financial portfolios and your financial plans. So I thought we could just talk about like the five biggest financial mistakes everybody, all of you are making right now and just breaking it down and what you can do to fix it. Well, you know, guys, first of all, the biggest issue that everyone who's watching this right now, listening to us right now, anyone I've ever talked to, anybody I ever know, the biggest issue and problem and risk in everyone's financial life is inflation. <laughs> and you know, I remember when the money market funds were paying 20%, everybody fell in love with that. But the inflation rate was 19%. So, you know, it's not about the, you know, the number, right? It's inflation. You got to make sure that your principal grows net of inflation after taxation. It's absolutely yeah. critical. Well, it's a huge problem because a lot of times we build an income plan, especially if we're getting ready to retire and we look at, okay, I need this much income every year. And maybe you go out and you buy like an annuity, right? And then that fixed amount of money comes in every year. Well, guess what? The income that you need is going to go up every year, but if that income from that annuity or that fixed amount coming in every year is the same, that's a big problem because the math's not going to work for you after a while in retirement. And at some point, your expenses are going to far exceed the income that's coming in. And that's one of the biggest problems we see a lot of you running into. Well, you know, we do so many of these financial plans. And when I go through and show our clients the projections, they're always blown away that in like 20, 30 years, they're going to be spending more than double what they spend today. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, inflation works both ways, right? It works, it works yeah, re yeah. Re really, it's a big headwind when it comes to your expenses. But, you know, Ry, I can't wait till, you, till your new book comes out, The Inconvenient Truths About Annuities. <laughs> I've been taking a long time to write it because I'm not a great writer, but it's going to be a fantastic book. Um, in fact, we should write that book. Now I'm getting inspired, Bob, as we're talking about this. You know, the other mistake I think everyone's making right now, and they're always making, is you're not optimizing your portfolio for taxes. And, you know, we have a famous saying here at Payne Capital, it's not what you make, it's what you take. And most of us don't take the time to structure our portfolios in a way where we're taking advantage of taxes in the best way. We talked about this earlier on the show, but right now, if you're getting 5% on a treasury bond, you're still paying federal tax on that. <laughs> and you have to factor that into your return. No, you really do. And I think the um, I think the trend for taxes is higher, not lower. I mean, you look what just happened in Canada last month. They raised their capital gains tax on any gain above 250000 to 67%. Wow. That's crazy. Huh. <laughs> it's just mind-boggling. So, yeah. you know, one of the things that I, I think a lot of folks miss the move on harvesting losses every year. If you have a loss, you know, like I always say, if you – if you see a loss, you take a loss. Um, just do a tax swap. You know, it's like it's a no-brainer. You don't lose your position in the market. You know, you move from one asset to the same asset, just in a different title. Uh, and then you, if you don't, can't use those taxes losses this year, you can carry them forward forever. You know, forever. And you know, eventually, you're going to make money if you're invested properly. And you know, those tax losses are invaluable. Yeah, and, and the other thing is, most of you, most of our listeners out there that are not paying capital clients. Uh, on mutual funds. So, you know, you're shocked every year when you have all these capital gains, you don't remember selling anything in a gain. Those mutual funds distribute those gains every year, whether you want them or not. Yeah, exactly. And if you're getting income from an annuity, it's usually ordinary income, which is the highest rate. And just all the other strategies you can look at, right? Are you optimizing building Roth money that you can take out tax-free later? Again, tax-free bonds today, if you're in a higher tax bracket, as much as like getting six or 7%, uh, you know, on a treasury, it, you know, on an equivalent when you look at the after-tax return. So it's not about the pre-tax return. It's about that after-tax return that you get on all your money and what portfolio you place it in is critical as well, right? A lot of times the big mistake we see is you're putting the wrong assets in the wrong account. You want to put your higher growth assets that are going to trigger the most tax in your deferred accounts, like your retirement accounts, your IRAs, 401ks, and then you want to put like your tax-free bonds and your more tax-efficient assets 
in your after-tax accounts. And most of us don't structure our portfolios that way. We don't look at the big picture. So Ryan, you're saying dad should put his AMC stock into his IRA? <laughs> I guess he wishes he would have done that earlier. You know, when he's trading those, uh, those options every day on it, he, uh, he definitely got hit hard this year. I'll tell you what, guys, that's why it's so great that you should work with a fiduciary because a fiduciary will do the right thing. And I, I've actually lost clients by doing the right thing. You know, I, I would buy them a portfolio, invest their money in a portfolio of municipal bonds, and then st- help them to manage their 401k, you know, which I couldn't custody with me and, you know, put it all into a growth strategy. And five years later, they go, Bob, I'm doing so much better in my 401k than you're doing that bond portfolio. I'm, I'm going to take that over. You don't know what you're doing. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute. I'm the one that designed that plan for you. You know, you didn't pick those investments. Uh, so you got to be careful uh, that you're, you, they understand, you know, the strategy in total and you don't get judged separately. Well, yeah, that's the other thing too, is looking at your investments holistically, right? You probably have lots of different accounts. You might have a 401k, you might have an IRA over here. You might have a brokerage account over here, a savings account over here, but you really have to look at everything in concert. And I think that's another big mistake because what we're seeing right now is a lot of what you call overlap. You know, maybe in a retirement account, you have lots of growth funds that own a lot of those mega cap tech stocks that we warn you about, not over concentrating. But then maybe you own in your individual brokerage account, you own Apple, you own NVIDIA, uh, you own Google. And then all of a sudden you own in all those other mutual funds you own. And then when you look at everything in one place, all of a sudden, all your money's in the same place, which is great when it's going up. But what I heard is that's very problematic, guys, when it's all going down at the same time. They call that you live by the sword, you die by the sword. You don't want that for your financial plan. So wait, Ryan, if I have the S&P 500 index fund and the S&P 500 equal weight fund, doesn't that mean I have a thousand stocks? <laughs> There's a lot of math going well, on there. That way, you know I'm not good at math. So you know, <laughs> don't push me, buddy. But no, it's more important than ever, right? That You really have to make sure that you're spreading that money out. And I think that's one of the biggest mistakes as well you're making today is not managing risk appropriately. And Bob, I love your saying, risk is only known in hindsight. It's only when the market sells off aggressively that you found out, whoops, maybe I didn't allocate my portfolio the right way. I should have listened to Bob, Chris, and Ryan. Well, it's kind of like the uh, Oracle of Omaha always says, you don't know who's swimming naked until the tide goes out. Yeah. So put those trunks on now because things are going to (laughs) change and you need to to make sure that uh, when that time comes that you're already prepared. And that's why a proactive strategy is way better than a reactive strategy. You know, I was thinking about it the other day and I was looking at uh, some some of my pictures from college and uh, we have one picture that we took in the grocery store. Don't ask me why. And uh, all the all the stuff on the shelf was a lot cheaper back then than it is now. I really wish we uh, we could go back then when things were a lot cheaper. And, you know, it's one of those things. It's like, you know, when you're doing your financial plan, you got to factor in that things are going to be more expensive as time goes on. You know, Chris, I've been hearing that all my life, the good old days. There mm-hmm. is no such thing as the good old days. It's the best it's ever been right now. And tomorrow is going to be better. All right. It's the Hidden Facts of Finance. Random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob, it's been a while since we've done these. It's good to be back. Uh, Mumbai is at the center of the real estate boom in India. In the latest quarter, 23,743 units were sold, up 17% from last year, and the most of any city in India. To put that in perspective, in New York City, there were only 7,904 homes sold in the first quarter actually down 11, 11% from the year before. Man, oh man, there's a lot of people in India and that's and that country is booming. Well, the last I looked, it was 1.4 billion people in India. That's larger now than China. I think China made a big mistake with that one child only policy. It's coming back to, to, uh, to bite them in the butt, as they say. But you should only have your money in the US. You shouldn't look globally at all. There's no other economy in the world that's going to do well in the next five to 10 years. I don't know, 1.4 billion potential customers. I think I want to do some business in India. Go global. Bob says so. Chris, investor sentiment can get crazy. Pets.com rose to 14 billion market valuation after it went public in February February of 2000. It's 24 years ago plus. Supported by they only had 3 million in revenue. Man, oh man, that's wild. You know, that's not too crazy. I mean, you think about a lot of those stocks back during the dot com era. You know, somebody had these wild market, so these market, let me say that again, three, two, one. That's not too crazy if you think about all those companies back in 2000. Like they had those crazy market caps, but no revenue to support it. Well, based on those metrics, I mean, our, our business is worth about 50 billion. So I'm getting excited. Maybe we'll get back to those heady days. We'll change our name to Pain Capital. 
Bob, the world's 50 most valuable sports teams are now worth a combined $256 billion, up more than 15% from a year ago, according to Forbes. Highlighted by Apollo Global Management co-founder Josh Harris buying the Washington Commanders for $6 billion, the most ever paid for a sports team. Man, oh man, it's crazy what sports teams are worth now. Yeah, it is. It really is kind of mind-boggling when you think about it. And, you know, especially the Washington Commanders. I mean, they were they were great in the 80s. <laughs> you know, they're, they're a losing franchise and they still get $6 billion? Wow. Blows my mind. Only if Bob Chris worked a little harder, bought a sports team for us, how much better would our life be today? <laughs> right. I still don't think you and I would watch sports, but you know, that's another subject. Fair point. Fair point. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed episode 159, Pain Points of Wealth. If you like our podcast, love it, please give us that five star rating on Apple. If you're listening to this on Spotify, you can like this. You can actually subscribe to our channel. And if this is on YouTube, you can subscribe as well. You can like this episode. And you can click that notification bell to be updated every week of our new content. Your support gives us the support to continue to do this podcast. As always, stay loose and keep an open mind. Thanks for listening to The Pain Points of Wealth. Hopefully, you found the ideas discussed in this episode valuable and useful for your own financial journey. You can find out more about Bob, Ryan, and Chris's firm, Payne Capital Management, at bebullish.com or through the contact information found in the description of this episode in your podcast player or app. Join us next week for another episode of The Pain Points of Wealth, brought to you by Payne Capital Management. Information provided on today's show is provided for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment, tax, or legal advice. Investment is obtained from sources that are deemed to be reliable, but their accuracy and completeness cannot be guaranteed. 